anyone want to kick us off with a, a hand raised? Mitch, whilst, whilst you're waiting, I'll just I'll just throw one at you. Um, how different do you think the courses are? So you're, you're a tutor now, but from when you started the college program um, with the likes of Jim Kelman, Mark Whiffin, and you did your level one, your level two, what do you think the fundamental are now becoming a, a tutor the other side of that? Um, I think the, the content was heavily focused um, on the technical outcomes. Um, going back then, like yeah. I think that was 2000 and 2004 when I'd done my one and two um, which was great you know at the time I was 17 18 and for me it was brilliant because I was learning and getting so much information about being a player um, and that's what it was all geared around you know everything was geared around just the technical element um, then mm -hmm. that was the old sort of um, structure where you went technique skill game um, and yeah, yeah that, it was just heavily focused on that. And I think I mentioned it while well, we were chatting the other day about it. And I, was, I sort of said that I finished my level two and then went coaching for Wickham Wanderers. And, you know, I was doing a group of year ones, year twos, and I was sort of doing like crossing and finishing sessions because that's what I thought was the right thing to do, if that makes sense. Mm. You know, mm. That's what mm. we covered on the course. And I was talking about, you know, standing for you know, the types of cross you're going to do, the delivery to like a six, seven-year-old when they've got mm. no interest in that, you know. it's They just want mm. to run around, have fun, play a game. Mm. You know, they don't want that too much technical information. Whereas yeah. when I was at college, when we done that, you know, that was great for me. Like I said, because I just wanted to play all the time and was playing quite a lot outside of college and in college. And for me, you know, it improved me massively as a player. But if I was actually coaching regularly at that time, you know, it wouldn't have had nowhere near as much of an effect as the courses do now. You know, when you're looking at dealing with difference models, four corner models, all of that sort of stuff. You know, yeah. It, it's just so much more relevant. And I think that's the, the biggest sort of change I've seen um, within the course. And, you know, I think you mentioned the other day about delivering a level one. Coaches come out the other side of that and everybody takes stuff from it. Everybody takes so much stuff from it. You know, you get teachers that come on the courses that understand children, but they don't understand football so much. You get non-league players, you know, that, that come on it, have played a half-decent level that really know the technical um, elements of the game, but don't understand kids and what makes kids work and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So um, that's my biggest sort of mm. two differences that I've that I've noticed. Um, yeah. You know, we're talking <laughs> 16 years, 15 years apart. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely more of a holistic approach now, and I suppose I have a bias towards the the, the, the new era, if you like, because that's what I'm involved in more and more. In. But I, I definitely remember going back. If anyone's old enough to remember the FA prelim, which I think I did in 1998, Palmer Park Sports Centre in Reading with Jim Kelman. Um, and that was more of a, a process. It was more sort of technique, skill, small-sided game. And I remember um, being at Palmer Park, 13, 14 Monday nights, freezing cold, January, I think it was. Um, I, Jim was outstanding, I thought. But, um, yeah, I, I remember the, uh, the, the topics that I had then. So it would have been, I think he was coaching the outside hook. So I mm, yeah, 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 yeah. 20 minutes, as you alluded to there, talking to people about where their non-kicking foot should be and um, looking at the ball and this, that and the other. But um, I suppose my point is, um, similar to, to other courses that I've done in that era, I just ended up homing in on that one thing, that one topic, because yeah. the process, um, I understood that if I get this bit right, then I get that tick in the box. So um, yeah. The way that I learned, I, I missed a lot of um, additional um, um, decent stuff because I was just heavily focused on. Yeah, it. I remember my B license, and the, the first time I'd done that, I got it was distribution from the goalkeeper. Um, so, like you said, they pull pull it out of the hat. I've got that, so I think I spent the last three days of the course knowing that that was my final topic. And that's all I focused on was that. So yeah. anything, information, I didn't care about anything else because all I wanted to do was obviously pass the course. So I was just focusing on everything I could get from the goalkeeper when I'd never done anything of that in my life, you know. I'd never even, you know, I think you do, we've done one day on the B licence. 
um, for, around goalkeeping. I had to then do my final topic on it, um, mm. which I went on to fail. Um, which I went on to mm. fail. I remember doing it and thinking, you know, this is this is tough. Um, whereas mm. tough, that's the totally flip side of it now as well. You know, on the, the level twos and the B license, obviously it's going out. Um, into the coaches' environments, and you know the, the topics they're delivering is based for the needs of their players. Whereas me delivering a goalkeeping topic, I've never done it. Mm. You know, to be honest, I I didn't know where to start. Um, yeah, I think. Players, I, sorry. Sorry, Mitch. Yeah, I think that's the the beauty of where the courses have gone now. We talk about level two, three, um, and even the A license courses now as these in situ visits that are set more well environment. So it makes it real and specific to you. Um, you know, I would have, I would have loved to um, I would have loved to have been on a course where someone actually came out to me to see what I was working with, to see the environment I was working in. And I appreciate when I go out, um, it is specific to the coaches that I'm working with at that period of time. So there are coaches that you talk about rival activities and stuff, which is great. But you know, I'm working in a goal centre, so I can't get in there because the other team were on till six o'clock um, and then as soon as they come out then we get in so all these things are um, uh, 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 relevant to the individuals which is what these institutes are geared to definitely good discussion chat I'm if, uh, Eastie, I think he's it Eastie oh sorry again mate is he on mute? He there, Sai? He'll come in when he can. It's all good. Well, we've got some questions in now, which is great. So, um, what about, this is from David Pierce, what about advice on, on content over a season? Reactive or planned program? There's been further discussions between himself and um, Eddie. But we'll just get Dave on call. Dave, you there? Yeah, hang on. Yeah. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? Pretty good, thanks. Uh, no. You just want to elaborate? Uh, no. <laughs> not <yet>. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, not really. it's just a, no, it's just a short, short out there to people. Um, really, I think um, I've got one role that I play where it's very much planned across the season, and at another club where I'm at where probably because of time, I'm a little bit more reactive, and I'm just wondering what's what people, other people do and what's best possible. Um, I mean, Mitch, you're, you're currently coaching with the team, but we, we talk about um, we talk about having practices, sessions, and then a program of work, so a scheme of work, if you like. Um, so, so practices are what we used to call drills. So we call them practices now, what we do in the FA, that's kind of our language. The session might be your hour session, your 90 minute session, your two hour session, whatever it is. But then I think what you're alluding to, um, David, is is a program, a block of work, a scheme of work that you might have over a sustained period. Um, so, um, and I've seen this happen, and I, I like it um, because I think as a as a novice coach myself, I, I felt the pressure to jump around. And in one session, I would try and deliver three or four things. So a bit on passing, shooting, heading, defending, um, not least because of the external pressures of um, you know parents watching, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I like a program that works. So I've identified for my team that, you know what, we need a bit more help um, pressurizing in the final third or whatever that thing might be. So then we're going to look at that for the same period. Where it, it differs, I think, is what you're getting at is something might have happened on a Saturday that then takes um, or you deem to be more important. So what do you do? Do you let that go because you've got a period of three or four weeks left? Is that easy Sorry. again? I think it's easy trying to get in, right? Just I'll ring him. Yeah. Um, so, so what do you do? Do you let that go because you've still got three or four weeks to do? Or do you deem that to be important enough to say, do you know what, we need to address that? We need to address that at the next training session because otherwise you miss a glorious opportunity um, on that to look at something um, and you end up letting it go and go and go.
ago. So it's a catch-22, I think, really. I think programs are, uh, are key, working on something. You as a coach identifying the needs and wants of your players. But then I think if something glaring comes out that you need to work on, I think you need to probably be reacting to that and, um, and, uh, and try and deal with it as best you can, um, given the time and resources. But, um, Mitch, you're, you're currently coaching a, a girl team. Do you have a programme scheme of work in place? Yeah, we do. Um, and similar to what you've just said, it's changed slightly um, going on, you know, how the season's panned out and stuff like that. But I think it's almost, you know, if you link it into the philosophy and how, you know, you want your teams to play or how I want the girls to play, that will always stay there. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got in place that, you know, we have tweets and stuff like that when, you know, start of the year, um, we, we sort of changed what we wanted to do because the league we put in um, and stuff like that, which changed sort of the coaching programme slightly. But, um, yeah, I think it's just about being adaptive. You know, it's like in the training sessions, you know, you'll, you'll put on a practice that you think, oh, this is going to work, and then you'll have to change it. You'll have to change the area size, the amount of players within that. Right, they've grasped that now. You know, they're, they, they've got that comfortably. How can we pro progress it on? How can we challenge them further? So I think it links mm. into that. Um, how have you found that, um, Gary? How have you found, obviously, you said you've experienced both sort of sides of it. How have you found that this season? Oh, don't think, Rich. Rich, can you unmute Gary? Gary, sorry about that. Yeah, here he is. Gary, you there? Doesn't seem to be there. We'll try Gary again in a minute. Sorry, chat. Yeah. Just to Mr. East. Uh, what do we get up to? Apologies. No worries, mate. We just um, said Gary on. About Gary's question? Yeah, yeah. So around 3, 3G? Uh, we, no, we haven't done 3G yet. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. I well, guess that was, my, that was my question. And I've been, sorry, I was, was David. Well, David. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just, um, <clears throat> I work in a centre where we've got all the equipment, all the players have got a really good, and all the facilities, etc. and it's probably easy to do whatever you want there, and they're all from different clubs, so that's it's very much a programme-based mm -hmm. development, and then I've got the grassroots team where we don't have the space, we don't have the kit, not because of, not because of the club, but because of the facility we're at, and also... They're so varied across the different needs that um, it tends to be a little bit more. There's always something in every match that you can react to, so it's, mm. it, becomes, it becomes a little bit like that. Um, whereas we've definitely got some much more planned things for the individuals at the centre of work. Um, so, yeah, I guess maybe yeah, you just got to look at, look at each situation and, and uh, work what you think is the best way to that situation. Maybe. Yeah. Not sure. Tuesday. Uh, yeah, so where do we go to, Mitch? Um, 3G pitches we haven't started on yet. Oh, right, we could. Let's get... Um, thanks, David, for that. Right. Gary, Gary there? Hi, guys. Yeah, sorry about that. I was trying to get on earlier on, and uh, when you were shouting, but I couldn't do it for some reason. That's all right, mate. So you've got a good question here around... Uh, when football was called off around Christmas because of the storms and now the virus. Yeah, obviously the um, the virus is a bit of an anomaly. Um, can't really do much about that at the moment, but um, it was something that Ad touched on um, on on the pod uh, last well earlier on in the week in regards to him going over to um, the Netherlands um, and there was three G pitches pretty much everywhere. I also travel quite a bit, and you know I've been into Switzerland, Netherlands, Germany. And they've got a substantial amount of 3G pitches compared to what we have. Um, and obviously, I do. Um, I, I coach under 10s, and obviously, I look after the Roman Rangers club um, across, you know, under sevens all the way to under 18s. And um, we're playing like two, three, four games on a single grass pitch every week, um, which obviously isn't good for for the grass pitches alone. Um, so, do you think the FA should really invest? more in uh, land and building more 3G pitches, you know. So, one, obviously, we have more to play on, but two, obviously, you know, we're not, uh, they're not affected as much by, you know, the weather that we have in the UK. 
Yeah, it's so, the richest one, mightn't it, I think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, from a county's point of view, and, and that's where the they are looking to. So, um, each county has their own different set targets of having additional 3G pitches. I'm mean, working alongside the Football Foundation. So, I define where the best um, areas are in terms of the amount of people living there, the demographics, etc. So, that, that there is plans to do that. These things obviously take some time for planning permission. And then to be a bill, and then to find the money. There's a lot of different things, but I, I, yeah, it's definitely plans in place. Hopefully, and actually to improve that. If you look at there was an initiative a few years back um, in some of the cities across the nation. So like Sheffield did it. It's called Park Life. They had a mass amount of 3G pitches which were used by um, grassroots teams, um, and there were different like hubs in the city. And it went really well. So I, I, last I heard, the FA were looking to broaden that across. But, um, yeah, I think it, it, I, I absolutely agree. And I've, unfortunately, I've been part of some of the things that have been going on. But I think some of, and I hope some of the other guys that are on the call will, will, will agree with, is when obviously we sort of, I say we as the FA, we sort of push forward to have these done. Obviously, it falls predominantly under the council. The council don't really have the... Um, knowledge or bandwidth to to manage these so basically then farm them out to uh, other businesses you know um, who will do it and the rents that they ask for or, or the um, you know the fees that they ask for for, for an hour as some of them are astronomical mm-hmm. and we're a community club and we try and keep costs as low as possible so everyone can be included you know um, and some of the costs for just just an hour for a third of a pitch you, you, you're talking 50, 60 pounds in some areas and mm-hmm. it's just too expensive, you know, and they don't, yes, it's great that we're pushing to have them, but if, if it doesn't follow through all the way down the end of the line, so the fees that are being charged, you know, even having them at like 25, 30 pounds is significantly cheaper than having at 50 to 60 pounds for, for an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. I think the FA, from my perspective, needs to sort of, not take ownership, but they, they need to basically stipulate that if they're putting the money into this, it has to flow through back to clubs like mine. Who, you know, we, we try and keep things low for, for in, inclusivity to, to make sure that we get the benefit of them rather than being priced out of being able to, to afford, you know, to play on them every week. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And uh, by no means, I'm an expert. It's not my like, region of work, but um, we do have people in the organisation that looks after this. Um, and when it's funded through the Football Foundation, the organisation in charge of, the say, a new 3G pitch, it's in there like guidelines of that, that annually to, to ensure so many grassroots teams and, and for example, like education courses, um, referee stuff, like it's, it's in their contract to, to, make, to ensure part of that funding that those teams are able to use it. Now, if the price is too high, those teams don't want to use it because they can't probably afford it. So, yeah. so there is guidelines in place. I suppose it just depends on what what uh, facilities are for all foundation. If they're, if yeah. they're just council only, then unfortunately probably the fees will be astronomical. Yeah, um, I say we've got we've got places over uh, that have just been built. You know, in the last sort of six twelve months, um, there's one over on the the sort of north side of Milton Keynes. Um, it's part of a school. They got they got council money to do it, yet they won't let anyone play on it. It's ridiculous. Mm. Mm. It's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? And as you say, going to the grass, I, I think, um, just moving the question on slightly, just around, because um, we've probably been getting on the chat, which is decent, around um, Matt's topic is similar. If we just get Matt in here as well, just around winter, summer thing. You right, Matt? Yeah, hello again. Yeah, hello. Just just building on that point, really. I um, I think Mark saw that we we listened to other podcasts apart from these, but there was another podcast what? that talked around um, <laughs> summer uh, moving <laughs> grassroots football to to summer. Um, here in Milton Keynes and my team, Woburn and Wavendon. Luckily, my under sevens haven't lost any any games this year, but I know some of the older age groups haven't maybe played for six weeks, maybe even longer. And that just cannot be right. Um, mm. So maybe if it's not the 3G, 4G option, is there an option to move football to summer? And yes, as a massive cricket fan, that 
doesn't sit comfortably with me either because it will impact cricket at, at grassroots. But is it an option to start exploring summer grassroots football? Yeah, well, is that me again, chap? <laughs> I'll say so, mate. Yeah, yeah the, the, these qu- these questions are above my pay scale, so <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna leave them to you, Rich. But um, yeah, I'll be in, I'm I'm just as intrigued as Matt. For answer, so, I'm not an expert, so I do apologise. But I, will, I, I do know, obviously, the season runs from 1st of July to the 30th of June. So the season has to complete in that period of time, as we know now because of this whole virus that has to extend for the existence of the programme. So that's where we have to plan and lead for plan um, seasons around that. In terms of some football, obviously, the weather's nicer. Um, there's more, I imagine there'd be a lot less chance of games being called off in that period of time. But also, like you say, other sports, primarily cricket and other sports as well, where the players would be committed to, like athletics, such and such. I suppose it's a whole conundrum. From personal experience, I used to work in the Isle of Man FA. Um, those who don't know where the Isle of Man is, it's not the Isle of Wight, it's the other one. And um, the we tried doing summer football, so the junior league. And um, initially it worked really well, but then people were have some holidays, obviously a six weeks period when the school's off and then games were called off because they didn't have enough players. So I suppose it's a really fine balance of, of finding that happy medium. Completely understand, it's, everything's out of our control. So Matt, you do like the virus and obviously that is an anom- anomaly, I'd say. Um, but yeah, there's just two storms that seem to happen every weekend and those games just got called off and as you say on your message there, six weeks. It's a long time not to be playing football for. And especially, yeah. River touched up the other day around that drop-off from 14 onwards. If you're having six weeks off of football, mm. you might not return. Yeah. And, yeah, it's some things that are out of our control, unfortunately. I think um, looking at, at Milton Keynes generally, it, it feels like it's a very heavily populated area with football clubs and not enough facilities, end of. Um, And that ultimately is the the root cause of the problem. So whether it is more 3G, 4G pitches, whether it is summer football, whether it's just making it more affordable. I think one of the the points I made, we were looking for 4G pitches or 3G pitches during that period. And and schools and facilities were putting prices up. And I get it, Mm. it's a business. Let's not kind of be naive about this. Everyone's got to make money out of it. Um, but something has to be done because there's less and less facilities that are becoming less and less affordable and ultimately less and less kids are playing football on a regular basis. Mm. No, I totally agree. Let, let me speak to my colleagues and see if there's some way we can get some information out, maybe to share um, even an option to do a little webinar like this as well, maybe. I think, yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's lack of information. From my part, anyway, I just don't know what's going on to address it. And I, I know what's going on within my own club. Yeah. Uh, but it would be interesting to, to know, yeah. I think, for all of us as coaches. Yeah, certainly. Which I think that would be a good idea if we can maybe get someone else on at some point. I think we've got um, a programme work scheduled in, but maybe if we could shoehorn someone else in from, from the County FA to maybe ask questions, that would be good, yeah. But some good points there, guys. Really good points, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't give you more of an answer. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, cheers, well, cheers Matt. Much. Cheers, Matt and Gary. Uh, Sorry, I'm just going through this. Uh, Rich, can I just say look out for um, you can. Dave. Look out for Dave Morris as well on here because I uh, think he's going to jump in at some point. Um, yeah. Um, Elliot, I'm sorry if this has already been asked to you. This is a game of plan sessions that are appropriate to age and ability of your players. If you're reactive, you'll go from one topic to another with no link. I think that was on about the first question, David's question. Uh, Sorry, guys. Yeah, I think that's linked to the coaching programme. Yeah. Question for Mitch. Yes. Here we go. I can have a minute off. Uh, from Tony Privet. Your Come best on, mate. Tony. Here he is. <laughs> so, interested to know a little more about the World Cups. Voices of anyone, actually. How do this like operation in this weekly, bi weekly, monthly? Sorry well, to, ask right to ask personally. Yeah, so um, you might be able to unmute him, actually, because there is a little thing on there, but um, we'll go over it anyway. Yeah, so the World Cups, Priv. Um, Basically, they're for girls 5 to 11. Um, and basically, it's to, to get new girls in that have never really played a game and give them regular opportunities. 
um, to come on board and, and um, yeah, get them involved in football. The sessions, because I actually run a centre, um, that was a couple of years ago now, so they can run, um, they run weekly, on a weekly basis. So we used to run ours on a Monday evening, but they can be um, at weekends, can be after school. Um, and I think there was at the time, or maybe now, there's over a thousand centres across the country. So, um, but yeah, mate, if you, I'm sure Middlesex um, FA will be able to provide you with, with, uh, some more information on that, mate. So, but hopefully that's helped. Well, I, I can elaborate, and hopefully I'm speaking to enough here. But uh, Jay, are you there? Hello. Hello, Jay. You all right? Yeah, good. Yeah. Sorry, mate. Sorry to stitch you up. I know. I know. I'm very excited. So, just going to Tony's question there. A wildcat session. You uh, sent. Sorry, you set one up last year, didn't you? We did. Yeah. So what? I'm oh, sorry for those who are interested in sports and football. Like, what was? What, yeah, what was the reason of starting a World Cup centre? Um, well, it was more because of the club that I was involved in. Um, we raised money for Sam's charity. Um, we wanted to kind of, we wanted to start a coaching session um, to raise awareness um, to different families for Sam's charity. Mm. So that was the initial thought. And then um, someone comes to us and said, Do you know of any girls teams? And we thought, Do you know what? Let's set something up. Had a little look into it. Um, found Wildcats on the FA website and thought, oh, well, let's do that then. And uh, kind of create an exit strategy for the girls to move into a different club. So we got in contact with local girls clubs. Um, set up the Wildcats session. And, um, yeah, and obviously once the girls felt they were ready or um, we after the 16-week program, the girls moved on to different clubs and a few of them are now playing. Um, sort of every weekend. Obviously not now, but they were playing every weekend. That's great. Yeah, that's well done, by the way. So obviously, as, as a club, you've divvied out the, the players, which is yeah. just like incredible, like in terms of the community. So um, yeah, sorry to stitch you up, but I think that's really, really good input. That's so thanks, mate. Oh no. Okay. Good to see you again. Uh, I hope that answers your your question. Um, Foot south for winter. All through the summer. A little discussion, I think, Rivo. Well, I, I just I just mentioned futsal because it's something that um you know, if I had my time again, I would have loved to have been involved in futsal. If you look at the way that the game's evolved now, um, you look at the players, let's go to Premier League, um, look at the goalkeepers. So if you look at someone like David De Gea and the shapes that he makes, you know, from futsal. Okay, look at the Schmeichels, Peter and Kaspers, Handball, um, which, you know, Adam, Adam Cole is probably best to talk about the um, transferable skills from different sports. But um, um, just look at the technique. So I know Mitch has played right back, I've played right back. So, so one example is when the ball comes back to you from a right midfield, let's say, your first touch. So mine, and I'm pretty sure Mitch's probably would have been inside of your foot to push it out to have your next touch. But if you look at the players now, it's, it's the studs that they use as a first touch to roll it out. Um, that's all derived from, from, from futsal. If you think about futsal, that big control surface when you're in a sports hall, that sole of your foot. Um, so it's, it's evolved from other sports like that. And I just think if, if we can build that in at some point, whether that is futsal in the winter and then we go to the summer leagues to, to go back on the grass. I don't know what the answers are, but I think a combination of, of both of them would be would be great. I don't know what you think, Mitch. Yeah, definitely, mate. Um, you look at the modern day player, how they're forever using the sole of their foot. Um, and I think Gary alluded to that it's, you know, you're playing four or five games in a row on a, on a Sunday morning, you know, the ball's covered in mud. Are you going to get seven, eight-year-olds using the sole of their foot to roll it across their body? Probably not. Um, because of the conditions don't allow it to, but um, mm. definitely that we we done it last year. Um, we started a sort of futsal centre on a Friday evening, um, and the kids just develop because they're getting so many more touches of the ball. It's all small sided stuff we were playing, um, and you know they're getting loads more touches of the ball, all different parts of their feet. You can't really hide in futsal neither. Um, mm. So whereas you know you're playing seven v seven, players might get lost. I think. Uh, Elliot brought it up last week. We we're having a discussion around this as well, um, and it's you know, the benefits. The benefits of it are, are huge. And you know, if you did manage to get, you know, it's the same as the 3G 
problem that we were talking about a minute ago, that pools do get booked up quite quick around, you know, between October and February, because a lot of teams do go inside. But if you, if you can get inside, the, like I said, the benefits for players um, are, are huge. And like I said, when you were younger, I was younger, it just wasn't around. Um, if we ever went inside, we'd be playing with a five size five might of football, which was just bouncing around like a ping pong ball. Um, but you know, there's massive benefits to it. We can think how good Rivo would have been if he played football. So, right, let's get a thief in because uh, he said about an idea. Steve, you there? Hello, Steve. Oh, Steve, you're there. Oh, Steve, Hello, mate. You're right. Hiya. Uh, yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, no, just uh, just about the futsal. I think whenever I've spoken to coaches about it who don't really understand it, they, I think there's still that snobbery about it. As it, mm-hmm. you know, they don't see it as as proper football or um, see it as just a bit of five aside. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've seen coaches think they're doing futsal sessions on a on a three G. Mm. pitch <laughs> um, mm. so it, it, I, I think there's a lot of uh, misconception <clears throat> around what futsal actually is and, and the benefits of it um, mm. so does your team does your team play it play it Hattie? it's I, I do bits and bobs but it's tough trying to I think as well because parents trying to educate parents about the benefits of it as well um, if if they're not seeing others doing it, um, you know, they're looking at it slightly differently as well. Um, mm. But and and also, I think cost comes into it as well. I think earlier, a few mm. of the guys mentioned about 3G pitches and stuff. You know, you trying to get an indoor pool. You know, yeah. once you kick, kick, kicked off the badminton players. Um, you know, you've got to try and uh, finance it as well. So that I think that's a a problem as well. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah, some good points here. Does anyone do futsal regularly with any of their teams over the over the winter months? You can just pop it on the chat, and then maybe Rich can sort of unmute you. And you can elaborate on how you found it, if anyone has. Yeah, there's a few comments here. Um, Elliot, all the best players in the world uh, started playing futsal. It's equivalent to playing 27 as five. Definitely. No, I'm passing another game. I'm just going to get Elliot in here while we've got some questions. Elliot. Hello. Hello. Hello, mate. So, do you, do you play futsal with your team? I don't play, actually do foot. We, we started a futsal um, session, the company I work for, and it kind of resonates with what Asif was saying. I don't think enough people, particularly in this country, um, understand what futsal is. So, there's kind of a few people kind of did it. And then, but then there wasn't really that interest because it's not like a part of our culture. But mm-hmm. um, I definitely am a bit of an ad- advocate of it. Um, and if not doing futsal, you can still, I think, as a coach, particularly in the foundation phase, take stuff from it. So you may not do a futsal session, but you can maybe make your area smaller and do, like, like Mitch has already said, the 3v3 games. You're still getting the, the outcomes of futsal because it's, it's small, it's lots of touches. And you're still you're still getting the same um, outcomes if that makes sense. So mm. I definitely think it's something we should be pushing. If not, maybe in a sports hall, you could still take some of the factors from what what is it that makes futsal? Well, it's the speed of the game. Decision making has to be quick because you've got no space. Um, mm. Maybe we can still adapt your sessions to get that futsal element out. Um, mm. Yeah, I think it's a culture thing. We we don't like change, but, so it's it's quite hard to get it. To roll out in big numbers. And you, and you mentioned that you mentioned about Coutinho being a great example of this as well. Yeah. So if you watch Coutinho, whenever the ball comes into him, he'll often put his foot on it, suck a player in, and it's like that stop and go movement. So it's a stop and go, and that probably comes yeah. from in a sports hall. You probably have to do that without thinking, because as soon as the ball comes to you in a sports hall, players on you. So that stop yeah. start movement is so effective. So he probably does it, and I think all the best players in the world, you'll notice they don't fear pressure. Somebody yeah. comes towards and they almost they're taking the lead. Right, come 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 into me, then, and then I'm going to quickly go stop start. And all, mm. I think all the best players have that skill. I think um, yeah, I think it's a good point. There's a there's a thing that we use as tutors on some of our courses with Coutinho and Futsal, so I'm sure it's accessible via um, YouTube. 
that's a really good point. And I think I grew, I grew up in a culture of playing where um, if I if I wanted to pass to some, well, it was it, it, if I had pressure on the striker, I wouldn't expect anyone to pass the ball to me because they'd say that you've got a man on. So we're not yeah. going to pass. That was the culture that I grew up in. But you look at players from overseas that have. Um, have oh. looked, we're in enhanced our leagues over here. Like you said, give it to me. Give it to me if I've got pressure on, because the picture changes around me. I can slow it up. I can, and I can suck players in. We can get players running, whatever it may be. But I don't know. Anyone's experience is that. But for me, it was don't pass, don't pass if you've got a man on. Um, yeah. But it's it's interesting the way it's changed. Um, Rich, Dave Morris is in here now, so I don't know if we can unmute Dave. Dave's a um, county coach developer way up north, Leeds and beyond. Um, Hello. 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 So quite common where you're coaching amongst the amongst the coaching fraternity up north. What sort of things will you do in the winter months? Um, yeah, the futsal league. So just to keep on that line. Um, yeah. So uh, up in Cumberland, I think that's that's, that's quite a developing uh, league for the winter months. Yeah. Coaches and kids seem to enjoy it. Um, mm. Just picking up from from some of the previous uh, sort of over the last couple of minutes. I think in terms of young players. Anything that that encourages them to be put in different situations is going to help the development. So, i.e., the futsal stuff is you know it's a little bit different from from the mainstream football. Um, yeah. Different, possibly a different skill set or to add to their skill set. So, I think yeah, yeah. something that's um, that's going to put them in a situation and possibly contribute to to giving them a different skill set. Yeah. Yeah. Really. <laughs> Cheers, Dave. Um, good to see you again, mate. I just want to get a take of we're going across continents now. Sam, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Hello, mate. So you're calling from China. For those of you who don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's it so like in China? Is it developing? Is it there already? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> it, it's interesting, really, because obviously I don't really know as a coach, I don't really know much about about futsal, um, and obviously. I I'd like to, but I can't really get on um, obviously the, any of the FA courses. Um, so I was just sort of um, in the, in the process of typing out a question there in the comment box. Okay. Um, so like, how would you um, sort of encourage coaches to um, obviously try futsal and deliver deliver futsal sessions in obviously in in the winter winter months that. Ever, like really done it before, um, and and obviously can't get on get on the courses. Would would you would you sort of direct them to um, practices online? Um, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm just gonna throw, throw it out there and and see because obviously I've, I'd like to to do more of it, but I don't really know the best ways to sort of incorporate it. If if that makes sense. Good question, River. Um. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're throw it open, but I think as you said, then online resources is a good way. We've got uh, Andy Ritchie coming on um, the. I think it's probably a live podcast. Rich, who's a, a massive advocate for for Fulso. Um, someone who's been coaching and tutoring for for, for many years in academies at academy manager roles, um, and he absolutely loves football. He's got some great resources, and he can point you in the right direction. So it'd be worth looking out. Um, to 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 see when Andy's with us. Um, yeah. And I, so I think um, you know Andy wouldn't mind us giving uh, um, us giving you his details, contact him personally. But um, yeah, you make some, you make some must be difficult not being able to access some of the courses that we offer here. Um, but obviously we are living in a technological age now where we can access things online. So hopefully some of that stuff will help. But um, if there's anyone in the group that's got any ideas. Uh, yeah, there's been some comments on that, River. Sorry to interrupt this. So there's some good yeah. resources on hard learning. Uh, Elliot, um, also Pete says he's a book on it. Uh, yeah. Steve says, look at Peter Prickett and Lewis Melville on Twitter. Big fans of football, so I might be able to help. 
Um, and there's also a Hive group as well, Sam. So, um, are you on Hive? Yeah, I'm on there. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I didn't know if 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 there was anything else um, in in addition to sort of the online resources and that. Um, yeah. I didn't think there was there was anything in in addition to that, but um, there's been some good sort of information thrown in there. So. Yeah, um, so just just to let you know, as though it's not planned yet, um, as part of this online coaching program, I'm looking to do courses as well. And I know, for example, yourself, logistically that wouldn't be possible, but it'd more be like an introduction to futsal. So those who haven't seen it before, um, and talk about what they what they're doing on level one course, um, or level one course, etc. So that they should be coming um, soon. But just I think might be able to going back to your sort of original questions, I know I sort of changed it a little bit there but um <clears throat> the sort of the obviously the the football is not it's still growing out here in terms of um the interest um and it obviously it's not where it is back in the uk um but the the lot of the the, the chinese coaches that i've been involved working with um like always try and coach the way that we coach um whether it's in, in the uk or whether it's whether it's in mm. europe um, and and they always sort of want to be educated the way that we um, the way that we get ed- educated back in back in the UK. Um, mm-hmm. So w- they do sort of th- this is from my experience, but they do sort of um, look up to, to to what we do and and, mm-hmm. and are more more towards um, leaning towards our sort of philosophy, the way that we do things, um, rather than. And the other the other side of the spectrum. So um, anything that we can sort of do to help them really is is a is a big plus. It's, it's, yes, that was funny to say. What what city are you in? Uh, Be- Beijing. Beijing. So okay. I mean, uh, two corners on the, on this. Mark, Mark Rivers and Dave Morris visited China last year. Right. Tell people about that guy. Um, I'll start, Dave, if you want, and then you can come in. But um, the week, I'm sure you're familiar, Sam, but we worked in um, a place called Chengdu. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, it's, I think it's the Chengdu FA, but some fantastic facilities there, amazing facilities I've ever been. Um, no, I've not been there, but I've, some of the facilities in, in Beijing here are, are phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I totally... Um, um, hear what you're saying in terms of culturally and how and how they look at us. We we did a little bit, if you like, a watered down uh, version of a, of a UA for B out there. Um, right. But it was Dave and myself delivered, and we found we were sort of observing session after session after session. But they looked very similar to what Dave and I and uh, as Harry yeah. was saying, looked very similar to what we were doing. Um, but culturally, it was different. It was it was I think I've said it on here before, but it was amazing. Um, for myself, having to really think about what I was saying, how I was going to present that, because yeah. uh, of language barriers, um, we had interpreters, of course, but um, you know you had to eradicate any form of jargon from from your language. Um, yeah, you, you really had to test yourself. It was brilliant from a coaching point of view. Um, I don't know what you thought, Dave. Yeah, I mean, pretty much the same. Uh, I think initially. Um, so I felt they liked to copy, as you say, Mark. Um, yeah. But I mean, to be fair, to the end of the end of the second week, they were be, becoming a little bit more comfortable, and yeah. then possibly um, showing a little bit more creativity. Yeah. Um, and I suppose I I just wondered whether if that's the the Chinese culture in in terms of, of coach education and, and copying um, either from from Europe or from ourselves or whoever it may be. Just wonder what maybe sometimes that impact has on the on the national team and and and, and the coach education for them as a country, uh, rather than developing possibly their own way. I don't I don't know what people's thoughts are on that. I hmm. think so from from what I've experienced with with being out here, it's it's very much um, like I'm going to tell you what to do and and you're gonna you're yeah. going to do it and you're like for example if you're your child's playing for a coach. Um, well, the coach is going to tell you exactly what to do, and you need to follow that way. And if if you don't pass the ball when I tell you to pass the ball, you're you're coming off. Um, so yeah. the the club that sort of the that I'm I'm coaching for, we we do some um, like uh, education in schools and, and things. 
um, and they their main sort of um, like stumbling block is when we're talking about um, trying to obviously get our players to be creative and can we yeah. can we get the ownership of their own learning and can we try and um, allow them to make their own choices and decisions and if that's not the correct one then that's fine and things and and a lot of them come like. Uh, it's not just foot football coaches, but it's the, like some of the the teachers who who are new to football and new to the coaching environment, um, and a lot of them come back and say, well, why why um, should we let them make their own like why should we let them fail when if they listen to us, the, and we we can direct them to the to the right way of doing things, and they're going to learn mm -hmm. learn quicker. Um, and there's been times there's been times when. Um, like players play for us, but they haven't many games. Um, yet they they will you week after you'll then see them playing for a team who was in the league and has won every game. And players don't, some players don't even get a game um, like that with that week. So it's it, it the the sort of the the mentality and the culture here is, is very different. But it, it the slowly. Just from again, from my experience, they're slowly sort of turning that around and and sort of um, accepting that that is the right way to allow the players to grow. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't know if you remember that, Dave, but um, I remember uh, we saw I think it was the Chinese women's under 17s or under 18s team indoors in the sports hall at Chengdu FA, but um, the coach was stood in the corner, sort of motionless and. Uh, um, were were doing a, I would call it a drill. It was a constant practice, and it looked very, very good. But there was no room at all for free expression. Everyone was silent. Yeah. No smiles on faces. It was it was an old-fashioned drill, yeah. one of which they were were very good at. It. Um, but so, but also so detached from the real game. I think um, I'm not. I went to I went to Shanghai um, a, a few years ago now, so I've been lucky enough to go a couple of times over across to China, and um, we were we were based at a, a university, and uh, upstairs from our classroom, uh, I think I, I don't know what subject it was, but it was very much um, a use of, of recitement for for kids. So the the teacher um, was making them repeat, um, and so then they were just in that copying culture. Um, so that obviously is is how their their culture is. Um, what impact that that has on the football and, and being creative? And I don't know. Mm. Okay, yeah, that, it's interesting as well because because here again I've found that it's 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 really competitive. So we like at school, um, like even in like the primary schools, everyone everyone wants to be the best they can be, and and it's. It's really, really competitive, so um, I think again, I think it does go down to sort of the the way that they learn and um, and and how they're sort of they're sort of taught in school, and then obviously when they come to football and they're 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 um, allowed to make their own choices, their own decisions, that they're not they're not used to that because they're not getting in the education out of football as well. So um, it, it, for me, it was a, it was a real learning curve coming out here and. and coaching out here and things um but the, the like i said they are sort of slowly slowly sort of turning towards how we do things and and, and understand that how we do things is, is the correct way to or the, the best way of allowing the kids to develop brilliant cheers sir cheers sir mate i'm just getting zing because zing you there yeah uh, yes correct me if i'm wrong and i might well be wrong uh you you travelled to the UK to complete a uh, level three. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, I suppose is that because of the, the way the, the like the English FA were educating coaches, or was that just a personal choice? Uh, sorry. So, what I suppose the question is, what? Why did you come to the UK to complete your level two? Ah, um, because uh, you know, in, uh, in China. Um, only you have a professional career. Uh, the former players can learn mm -hmm. the CFA license. Okay. Uh, so I I, so I chose so I chose the the FA because the the FA uh, uh, the course for the for the everyone. 
Wow, so you made a, that's a massive compliment to come over. But obviously mm. you enjoyed it because you've dialed in on this as well. So, mate, well done. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for joining Thanks, us. Huh. Great to speak to people in uh, China, River. I, I think I think I think these have been absolutely fantastic. We're seeing the same names, um, people that want to educate themselves. And this, uh, us as FA staff, and um, I suppose we're front in this, but we we don't know everything. So it's great to dial in and let people talk and give us their views and the chat boxes and things like that because you know, we're we're educating ourselves at the same time. I just think it's it's fantastic. Um, yeah. We could, time for one more question. Just yeah. want to unmute yourself and go for it. Feel free. Whilst whilst thinking of that, Rich, I just think this is this is the the great thing in my opinion that um, with this England DNA that's come in, and I said it many a times before, but um, for years we would have looked elsewhere. You know, we would have gone to Spain and Italy and Germany, Belgium, um, France, Cape Fontaine looking for a way or the best way to, to deliver our courses for our teams to play. And I think since we've had our own identity, our own DNA, I feel um, a, a, a shift, not only on the, the playing side, but I think on the coach education and development side of things also, I think we're really upskilling ourselves as, as coaches. And I think if you look around grassroots now, people are sort of wrecking their brains about words like culture and having a playing and coaching philosophy um, kind of thing. So I, I really do think it's empowered us and it kind of made me laugh. I think it was a game when um, John Stones was coming out, um, playing out from the back and he played it in and it got cut out and the other team scored. I can't remember the game. And it was like, yeah. why, why are we trying to play out from the back? Why don't we just rip this thing up? And But, you know, Southgate said, we can't, this is the way that we're playing. We can't just rip it up. This is something that we believe in, rightly or wrongly. Everyone can probably look different. But we're going to stick at this thing and um, and see where it takes us. So that that's where I am with it. And um, I feel, you know, there's things like this. And when we go out for in situ, about Dave and Mitch, but um, I can definitely see a shift with, with coaches. And uh, um, Adam Colley was mentioning earlier about we need to be creative. If we're creative as coaches, then that will filter down to our players, and I can definitely see that. Mm, definitely. Just there's been a bit of chat. Those who may not be able to see it. I think just on that as well. Just, on it. Sorry, just to jump in, but that just sort of goes full circle on what we spoke on. Asif's just put up a great point. Um, I think it's the fourth one back up. If you all have a little read of that, that just links into totally with what you just spoke about, Rivo. And, mm -hmm. you know, the first question you asked me an hour ago was, you know, my opinion on when I've done my level one, level two, you know, 15, 16 years ago compared to now. And I think that just sort of brings everything together. Um, what you've just finished speaking about now and also the differences. And, you know, like you say, you know, sometimes coaches, you know, that don't don't have all the answers. They think they do. We think we do. Um, but we don't ask the kids, we don't ask the players, you know, whether that be in under sevens, eights, nines, fifteens, twenties, twenty ones, whatever that might be, even senior senior level, you know, sometimes you're the ones that have been playing. What's your thoughts on it? You know, do you think the system's working? Hmm. Include them in that process. I think that's a great point just to sort of finish on. Yeah, yeah, really good. All right. Uh thanks guys. It's literally bang on an hour, so we may as well uh Call it a day there. I'm just going to keep sharing my content. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers, Rich. Cheers, Dave. Cheers, cheers, Rich. Cheers, everyone. Yeah, cheers, everyone. Just remember, podcast. You've been up, seen it. Do it. And uh, next, coming up next Tuesday, uh, Man United versus Bayern Munich. Uh, Rivo's name's on there, but he's actually doing it. It's myself, Austin Harris, and Simon East. Hopefully, we can work out on the technical issues with Simon. And um, podcast live, Mitch Woodward. Next Thursday, hey, hot we seat, mate. Patrick, oh, Patrick. Can't wait. Yeah. Look forward to doing the CBD session. Brilliant. Cheers, guys. See you soon. If you missed any, link is there. But yeah, take care, guys. Look after yourselves. Thanks for dialing in and um, speak to you soon.